Thanks for tuning in to Gnostic Studies. Tonight we are going to conclude our studies on the mystery religions of the ancients. With symbolism concealing the secret doctrine. There is no fact in history more easily and completely demonstrable than the existence of the secret doctrine in all ages among all people and of adepts or masters who were familiar with its teachings and more or less capable of expounding its principles. It is equally demonstrable that the secret doctrine was the real foundation of every great religion known to man and that only the initiated knew the real doctrine. Furthermore, the sacred books of all religions including those of the Jews and the Christians, were and are no more than parables and allegories of the real secret doctrine transcribed for the ignorant and superstitious masses. All commentaries written on these sacred books, whether on those of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets of Judaism, the Gospels of the Gnostics and the Christians, or those written on the sacred books of the East, all either make more confusion when written by one ignorant of the secret doctrine, or when written by initiates, further elaborate the parables and allegories. The secret doctrine is the primitive wisdom religion. It is the esoteric knowledge. This doctrine is everywhere and at all times essentially the same. Only the outer gloss, the parables and allegories concealing it differ among different people. Underlying this secret doctrine was a profound philosophy of the creation or progressive development of the universe and of the human being. If you have any questions or comments at any time, feel free to put them in the comments area. The Symbolic Teachings of the Mysteries In ancient times, Long before the Egyptian Empire even began to flourish, there existed an ancient type of mystery school ritual or occult masonry, which was beautifully symbolic. Those rituals differed so greatly from those that currently exist in the world that it would be impossible for the modern mason to admit that they were Masonic. The colors black and white were combined on their clothing to represent the struggle between spirit and matter. The symbol and the tools of work were used inverted to represent the drama that is projected into the century, the descent of spirit towards matter. So they surprisingly had inverted scepters, inverted chalice, etc. Everything was inverted. Life was at this time descending towards matter, and it was necessary then to give symbolic expression to this. The sacred processions were grandiose. They made the great mysteries and the supreme descent of spirit towards matter understandable. This was the magnificent event that was awaited through the course of the centuries. It was awaited with as much yearning as it is today the return of a human being to the superior world. God made himself man in order to defy man. Heaven united itself with earth to transform earth into heaven. But in order that these divine transformations can take place, an entire change, a complete and absolute overturning and upsetting of our being is necessary. This change, this upsetting, is called rebirth. To be born simply means to enter into a world in which the senses dominate in which wisdom and love languish in the bonds of individuality. To be reborn means to return to a world where the spirit of wisdom and love governs and where animal man obeys. The rebirth is triple. First, the rebirth of our intelligence or understanding. Second, of our heart and of our will. And finally, the rebirth of our entire being. The first and second kinds are called the spiritual, and the third, the corporeal rebirth. Many pious men, seekers after God, 
have been regenerated in the mind and will, but few have known the corporeal rebirth. This last has been attained to but by few men, and those to whom it has been given have only received it so that they might serve as agents of God in accordance with the great and grand objects and intentions, and to bring humanity nearer to felicity or great happiness. It is now necessary, my dear brother, to lay before you the true order of rebirth. God, who is all strength, wisdom, and love, works eternally in order and in harmony. He who will not receive the spiritual life, he who was not born anew from the Lord, cannot enter into heaven. Man is engendered through his parents in original sin, that is to say, he enters into the natural life and not the spiritual. The spiritual life consists in loving God above everything and your neighbor as yourself. In this double love consists the principle of the new life. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments area. The Philosophical Death of the Masters Initiation means death and rebirth into another life. Occupy yourself with learning the truth. The philosophical death of the masters is the death of the ego. This is something very serious and must be understood, so that we can know the meaning of the symbolism of death which is present in all the mystery schools. This is a subject which Gnostic psychology explores in depth. But at this point, let us say that the ego, as it is understood in Gnostic psychology, is used to describe all of these subjective likes and dislikes, desires, aversions, opinions, beliefs, etc., that we carry within. Due to the ego, we lack objectivity, continuity of purpose, and generally miss out on all true opportunities in life. The ego keeps us in a dream. It filters our perception of reality so that we do not see things as they truly are. As a result, we're trapped in a way of thinking, feeling, and acting, which only leads us to more suffering and pain. Buddhism emphasizes this concept very clearly. In order to end this confusing mess, we must find the cause. Our present life is the effect of our past life. It is a continuation of our past life. It is the effect of a former cause. Every cause has its effect, and every effect has its cause. Every cause transforms itself into an effect, and every effect was converted from a cause. Our present life is the cause of our future life. The cause of our future life will be this present life with all of its errors and, mis and miseries. To continue the way we are means to postpone our errors and pain. Therefore, what we must do is to die from instant to instant in order for us not to continue the way we are. It is better to be than to continue. The I, the ego, is constituted by thousands of little eyes which only wish to satisfy their desires and to create karma. The eye is the origin of error and of its consequence, which is pain. Thus, as long as the eye exists, pain and error will continue to exist. So the philosophical death is the psychological death of oneself, to die to all the causes of our pain and suffering to end with our subjective way of being in order to seek for authentic objectivity. This process of dying occurs when we change our perspective on life, and this leads to a change in our level of being. And then we will begin to see that the causes of our present life exist within ourselves. And as we address these causes, and that begins, the new effects are produced and our life is changed step by step into something different, into something more profound, into something with authentic value. 
So all of this is related to our psychology, our thinking, feeling, acting, our internal state, our attitude, or perspective on life. If you have any questions or comments so far, please put them in the comments area. Initiation is life itself. The main thing that we need to understand about initiation is that initiation is your life itself. It is profoundly internal and profoundly individual. Those who resolve to lay the heavy cross of initiation upon their shoulders will find themselves persecuted and even hated by those spiritual brethren who live talking daily about initiation. In this day and age, the Masonic Lodge grants degrees based on money and social status. Many people sell initiation. Many people are bestowed with initiation. All of this is exploitation and black magic. Authentic degrees and authentic white initiations are received in the consciousness. These initiatic ceremonies are performed within the superior world. They are intimate experiences of the consciousness. They must not be revealed nor spoken about. No one can grant initiations to anyone. Initiation is attained through life itself. In this day and age, everybody wants to be a master. We say that there is only one master, the internal Christ of every human being who comes to the world. Only he is the master. If you have any questions or comments, please uh, submit them in the comments area. Understanding the path of initiation. As we mentioned in previous classes, all the ancient mystery schools tested their initiates before allowing them to enter into their studies of the esoteric side of religion. In the past, these tests were performed physically. In the solitude of those mysterious sanctuaries, the neophytes were submitted to the four initiatic ordeals, the ordeals of fire, of air, of water and of earth, always to find the different purifications of the neophytes. The neophytes are submitted to the four initiatic ordeals which are verified in the internal world. Man is still not king of nature, but he is called to be so after the order of Melchizedek. The disciple must be tested in the four elements in order to examine him. He is submitted to ordeals in the 49 regions of thought. These ordeals are for all men and women. In the ancient Egypt of the pharaohs, these four trials had to be faced in the physical world. Now candidates have to pass these four trials in the supra-sensitive world. The ordeal of fire. This ordeal is to prove the serenity and sweetness of the candidate. The wrathful and angry inevitably fail this trial. The candidate who is persecuted, insulted, wronged, etc., many are those who react violently and return to the physical body, having failed completely. The victorious are received in the chamber of the children and are welcomed with delightful music. Ordeal of air. Those who despair because they lose something or someone, those who fear poverty, those who are not willing to lose what they most love, they all fail in the ordeal of air. The candidate is thrown into the depths of the precipice. The weak cry out and return terrified to the physical body. The victorious are received in the chamber of children with celebration and feasting. The ordeal of water. The great trial of the water is really terrible. The candidate is thrown into the ocean and believes himself to be drowning. Those who do not know how to adapt to the various social conditions of life, those who do not know how to live among the poor, those who, after being shipwrecked in the ocean of life, reject struggle and prefer to die, they, 
we inevitably fail in the trial of the water. The victorious are received in the chamber of the children with cosmic festivities. Ordeal of the Earth. We must learn to take advantage of the worst adversity. The worst adversities bring us the best opportunity. We should learn to smile before all adversities. This is the law. Those who succumb to pain before the adversities of existence cannot victoriously pass the trial of the Earth. In the superior world, the candidate finds himself between two enormous mountains that menacingly close in on him. If the candidate screams with horror, he returns to the physical body, having failed. If he is serene, then he is victorious and is received in the chamber of the children with great festivity and immense happiness. Any questions or comments so far, please leave them in the comments area. The plan of the church, temple, or lodge, which is the tabernacle of the human soul. In all the ancient mystery schools, the real temple is the tabernacle of the human soul. In Freemasonry, this temple is symbolized by the Masonic Lodge. Gnostic Kabbalah teaches that the soul, the vehicle of the spirit, must be created, that we do not have a soul unless we manufacture it, and that right now, instead of the soul, what we have are the three rebels or the three traitors, which are desire, the mind, and ill will. What we do have is the seed of the soul, or the essence, the building materials, which we must use to manufacture the soul. And this is the symbolism of the rough stone, which must be converted into the perfect stone, the cubic stone, with its nine corners. We mentioned the symbolism of Arcanum 9 in the previous class, but now let's look at some of the deeper symbolism it contains. Gnostic Kabbalah, there are ten sephirah, or seers, which are often referred to as the different aspects of God. The tree of life is also a model or diagram of the universe and of man. Beneath the ten sephirah, Malkuth, or the kingdom, which corresponds to the material or physical world we live in, is what is called the klipas. Klipas is the inverse of the nine superior sephirah that lack the light or divine aspect that the superior aspects contain. The sephira of the klipa are often referred to as cortices or shells because they are hollow or empty compared to the superior sephira of the tree of life. Kabbalists call sin a cortex, the bark, they say is formed as an outgrowth that shrivels on the exterior through the sap which clots instead of circulating, so the bark dries and falls off. Similarly, the man who is called to cooperate with God's work and to complete himself by perfecting himself through the act of li his liberty, if he instead lets himself clot in the divine sap which must serve to develop his faculties for the greater good, then that man accomplish a retrograde process. He degenerates and falls down like dead bark. But according to the Kabbalists, nothing leads to evil in nature. Evil is always absorbed by good. The dead bark may still be useful by being picked up by the farmer who burns them and warms himself through their heat. Then he makes from their ash a nutritive manure for the tree, or better, in putrefying themselves at the foot of the tree, they nourish it and return to the sap to the root. In the ideas of the Kabbalah, the eternal fire which must burn the wicked is then the regenerative fire that purifies them. And through these painful but necessary transformations, makes them serve for the general utility of the good and eternally renders them to the good which must triumph. 
God, they say, is absolute good, and there can only be two absolutes. Evil is the error which will be absorbed by the truth. It is the bark that, whether putrefied or burned, returns to the sap and contributes anew to universal life. And any questions or comments so far, uh, please submit them in the comments area. Masonry and the Vault of Secrets In a Masonic Catechism from 1785, we have the following exchange, where the Most Venerable asks the apprentice a series of questions. Question. My brother, where do you come from? Answer. Most Venerable, I come from the Lodge of St. John. Question. What is done at the Lodge of St. John? The answer. Temples are raised to virtue, and vaults are dug for vices. Among the mystery schools of the ancients, the initiates were purified before being admitted into the lesser mysteries. In the early days of Christianity, no proselyte was made a member of the mysteries until after they were baptized. When these new initiates came into the lodge, they were asked the same question. Understanding that their response, I come from the Lodge of St. John, explicitly means I just came from being purified by the waters of baptism. Remember that it was St. John who instituted the sacrament of baptism, which is the great art of conquering one's passions and the practicing of virtues. Temples are raised to virtue makes sense. But why are vaults dug for vices? And we're referring to the question and answer for the catechism here. In a Masonic encyclopedia, we learn of the rebuilding of the Temple of Jerusalem, which occurred at a later time after it had been destroyed by a conquering army. As a symbol, the secret vault does not present itself in the primary degrees of masonry. It is found only in the high degree, where it plays an important part. And here are some extracts from the Masonic legend of this bowl. The foundations of the temple were opened and cleared from the accumulation of rubbish, so that a level might be procured for the commencement of the building. While engaged in excavations for this purpose, three fortunate sojourners are said to have discovered our ancient stone of foundation which had been deposited in a secret crypt by wisdom, strength, and beauty to prevent the communication of ineffable secrets to profane or unworthy persons. The secret vault had been built by Solomon as a secure depository for certain secrets and would inevitably have been lost without something like this being done for their preservation. The vault was, therefore, in the ancient mysteries, symbolic of the grave, for initiation was symbolic of death, where alone divine truth is to be found. The Masons have adopted the same idea. They teach that death is but the beginning of life, that if the first or evanescent temple of our transitory life is on the surface, we must descend into the secret vault of death before we can find that sacred deposit of truth, which is to adorn our second temple of eternal life. So from this we can see that the secret vault or crypt is where the foundational stone is to be found, the cornerstone or the cubic stone of your sod, along with certain secrets. And in the ancient mysteries, the vault was symbolic of the grave and death, which was related with initiation. Therefore, we have three things that are interrelated. The vault, crypt, or grave, the ancient stone of the foundation, or cubic stone of Yasod, and initiation. But how is all of this related to the vices mentioned by the apprentice? In order to understand this, we must remember 
what has already been said about the significance of the number nine. In the esoteric principle, we must descend in order to ascend. If you have any questions or comments, please submit them in the comments area. The work upon oneself. Something that seems confusing and is often misunderstood is the work on oneself. If we wish to get rid of our vices and replace them with virtues, then we have to first become aware of the vices. In Gnosis, the self-awareness is achieved through what is called self-study. And the chief method of self-study is self-observation. By studying oneself, one is able to discover the defects or vices and observe them before they're acted upon. If we act on them, then we are the defect or vice that we've carried out. We effectively become it since we did it. But if we study ourselves and see that the vices come up in our thinking and feeling, and then we don't act on it, we don't carry it out, then we've begun the process of becoming a better person. So in order to be a better person, we have to stop doing the things that are making us a worse person. Samuel Amir explains this concept very well when he says, in order to start being someone we are not, we have to stop being the person that we are. Another way of saying this is that in order to be a different person, we have to die to the person that we are. This is why the symbol of death is used, the grave or the crypt. The process of becoming a better person by discovering our vices is symbolically represented as descending into the abyss or the well of the abyss or the deep well of the universe. This is why it's said that in order to ascend, one must descend. In order to become better, we might first discover what is making us what we presently are. And this is a process of confronting ourselves and who we really are. And of this is clearly related to the level of being. All the topics of self-study are covered in detail in the field of Gnostic psychology. Gnostic psychology is the study of principles, laws, and facts relating to the individual's radical definitive transformation. We must descend into ourselves, submerge ourselves in the profound study of who and what we are. This will lead us to some deep truth about ourselves. It will allow us to know ourselves as we really are. Know yourself and you will know the universe and its God. But of course we must know how to do all of this consciously, that is, with a profound awareness. Remember that in Gnosis, consciousness is a very particular kind of apprehension of inner knowledge, which is totally independent of mental activity. Our consciousness is presently trapped in our vices, passions, and defects. It is asleep or dreaming about who and what we are. So we must work in order to awaken it. And Gnosis has scientific methods to achieve that goal. When we practice the techniques and the methods, so we get some inner knowledge, which is related to our own personal psychological state. This is why studying Gnostic psychology is so helpful, not only for understanding the knowledge we receive, but also for the techniques it has to awaken the consciousness. If we apply the techniques of Gnostic psychology, studying and observing ourselves, we will discover that throughout the day, we spend an enormous amount of time unaware of the present moment. During this time, we are either thinking about the past or the future, what was, what could have been, what will or could potentially be, etc. If I had done this, then things would have been different now. Or, I'm so glad I did that. Wasn't that a good time? We wish, we recount, we dwell on both the good and the bad, all while forgetting that the power to make life whatever we want to be is right here, right now. 
And as we have said, the level of being is directly related to the present moment. And if we want to change who we are, we can only do it now, not in some remote past or in some distant future. Therefore, in order to awaken our consciousness, we must start by becoming aware of ourselves right here and right now. If we go into the abyss without the esoteric technique of self-observation, then we are going to get stuck there and we will not be able to escape. The secret truths, the secrets which are found in the vault, are about ourselves and our own particular psychology. This is why Masonry says, we must descend into the secret vault of death before we can find that sacred deposit of the truth. Once we discover, confront, and admit the truth of what we are, about our vices, passions, and defects, then we can stop doing them, kill them, and die to these things in order to become a better person. This is how death is related to the vault and to initiation. And as we've already said, initiation is related to the number nine. The initiate has to descend to the nine submerged spheres in order to later attain the nine heavens. In the Bible, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 9 through 10 says, Now that he's ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. If we look at the illustration of the vault, which can be found in many Masonic manuals, we'll discover something very interesting. It too contains nine levels. If we study Dante's Divine Comedy, then we'll also see that nine hells are described. This nine indicates the individual work that we must all do if we really want to know ourselves. But do we have a helper, our own personal trainer in this work? It is our coach or our trainer who tests us in the work on ourselves, an often misunderstood character who personifies our defects and goes by the name of Lucifer. If you have any comments or questions, Please submit them in the comments area. Lucifer, our psychological trainer. Religious esotericism does not teach any kind of atheism, except in the sense implied by the Sanskrit word nastika, meaning that there is to be no admission of idols. Included in this is the anthropology the morphic God as the ignorant. The idea of a celestial dictator sitting up there on his throne of tyranny, throwing thunderbolts against our sad human anthill. Esotericism does teach about a logos or collective creator in the universe, a demiurge architect. This demiurge is not a personal deity, as many wrongly suppose but only the collection of the Dayan Goen, the angels, the archangels, and the rest of the forces. God is God. It is written with characters of fire in the resplendent book of life that God is the army of the void, the great word, the verb. We can and must radically eliminate all the passions, vices, the subjective psychic aggregates which we have inside. However, we'll never be able to dissolve the shadow of the intimate logos within ourselves. Lucifer is the antithesis of the creator Demiurge, its living shadow projected into the profound depths of the microcosm of man. Lucifer is the guardian of the door and of the keys to the sanctuary, so that only those anointed and possessing the secret of Hermes can enter it. Each one of us has our own particular Lucifer. In the Egypt of the Pharaohs, the midday sun, the sacred absolute sun, was always symbolized by Osiris, while his shadow, his reflection, his Lucifer, was allegorized by Typhon, also known as Set. 
in the sacred temples of the old Egypt of the Pharaohs. When the neophyte was at the point of suffering the ordeals of initiation, a master drew near to him and quietly murmured into his ear this mysterious phrase, Remember that Osiris is a black god. Obviously, this is the specific color of darkness and of the command shadows. It is the color of the devil, who was always offered black roses. And it is also the color of primitive chaos, where all the elements and seeds of life are totally mixed and disordered. A symbol of the earth element, of the night, and of the radical death of all the psychic aggregates, which in their conjunction constitutes the ego of myself. We need, with maximum and unpostponable urgency, to whiten the devil. And this is only possible by fighting against ourselves, by dissolving that ensemble of psychic aggregates which form the I, the myself, the oneself. Only by dying within ourselves can we whiten the brass and contemplate the midnight sun, the Father. This means overcoming temptation and eliminating each and every one of the inhuman elements that we carry within. Anger, greed, lust, envy, pride, laziness, gluttony. When we have dissolved the ego, the myself, we'll discover with mystical astonishment that there is something which is not possible to dissolve and that something is hated by the people of all the religions. This something is the biblical Satan. We know the role that the devil has played in the Old Testament, and we must comprehend what Satan is. That devil, which scares us so much, is less harmful than we are led to believe. But all the religious people think that Satan is very harmful, and if we pronounced ourselves in favor of Satan, they declare us to be Satanists, black magicians, sorcerers, witches, damned people, etc. However, you should remember that Satan is the shadow of the Eternal One. We can dissolve the ego, reduce it to dust, but Satan we cannot dissolve because it is the shadow of the Eternal One. If we go on a terrace, we protect our own shadow. We protect it from the light of the sun. So too does the Eternal One project its shadow in each of us. Remember that each one of us has a divine spark, virginal, ineffable, which is our intimate logos, our deity. It projects its shadow into our psyche, and that shadow is indeed Satan, Mephistopheles, or Lucifer. Satan, the shadow of the Eternal in each of us, must be transformed into Lucifer. Lucifer is the giver of light, the star of the morning, and also the vespertine star. We must then transform the devil into Lucifer. When we see our own devil in the superior world of cosmic consciousness, we comprehend the necessity to transform it. But here is what is so spectacular, to transform, to convert that black shadow, that devil, into Lucifer. And this becomes possible when we eliminate the animal ego, when we destroy the inhuman element that we carry inside. Then that shadow of the eternal can dress itself in the tunic of glory and convert itself into an archangel of light. So it's necessary to turn the devil into Lucifer, to modify that black and tenebrous aspect of the shadow of the eternal, to whiten it in order to make it pure and perfect, to embellish it through the dissolution of the animal ego. Lucifer is only the shadow of God, the shadow of the intimate logos within our soul, or better said, our profound inner logos, the intimate Christ projects its shadow within us, and that shadow is useful. We need it. If you read the Divine Comedy by Dante, you will see how Virgil and Dante descended on the stairs of Lucifer. Each hair of Lucifer's body seemed like a beam by which they went down and also up until arriving at the top where the Golgotha, Jesus, was crucified. In. This is symbolic. Lucifer is the stairs to go down 
Lucifer is the stairs to go up. The Christ has disguises himself as Lucifer in order to serve as stairs for us and to get us out of the abyss, carrying us to the light. Therefore, we must look at Lucifer from a new point of view. Lucifer is the spirit of the spiritual illumination of humanity and of the freedom of choice, and metaphysically, the torch of humanity, the logos in his superior aspect, and the adversary in its inferior aspect, the divine and chained Prometheus, the active and centrifugal energy of the universe, fire, light, life, struggle, effort, consciousness, liberty, independence, etc. The sword and the scale of cosmic justice are entrusted to Lucifer because he is the standard of weight, measure, and number. Inside each one of us, Lucifer is a reflection of the intimate Logos, the shadow of the Lord projected onto the depths of our being. So Lucifer is the divine daemon, the Socrates, our special trainer in the psychological gymnasium of life. Lucifer trains us by testing us through temptation. If we fall into temptation, then we fail the test. But if we triumph over temptation, then we pass. As we pass more and more tests, we climb up the ladder or staircase of Lucifer, converting the shadow of God into an archangel of light. By the stairs of Lucifer, one must descend and one must ascend. Each test is an individual aspect of ourselves, which is called an ego, and some egos are stronger than others. As we convert our vices into these virtues, we become better and better people. There is a very interesting poem called The Psychomachia, Contest of the Soul, written by Aurelius Clemens Prudentius around 410 AD, which helps us to understand the conversion of vices into virtues. It describes the battle of good virtues and evil vices, and help popularize the Christian concept of the seven deadly sins and seven heavenly virtues. As a virtue, we have chastity or proper sexual conduct. Its vice is lust. The virtue of temperance or self-control has a corresponding vice of gluttony. Charity or generosity as a virtue has greed or covetousness as its corresponding vice. Diligence, the virtue, is opposed by sloth or laziness for the vice. Patience is opposed by wrath or anger. The virtue of kindness or being caring is opposed by the vice of envy. And the virtue of humility or being humble is opposed by the vice of pride, vanity, and shame. As we eliminate our egos of lust, gluttony, or greed, they replace with the virtue of chastity, temperance, or generosity, etc. This is the purpose of the esoteric work and the initiatic knowledge, to kill the defect, vice, passion, or traitor, and build a temple to virtuousness. This temple is the house for God, our soul. It is something that we must create by changing our level of being, and no one else can do this for us. This is the mystery of why we have free will, so that we can choose to get closer to God or not. We don't have to. It is our choice. If you have any questions or comments, please uh, submit them in the comments area. Esoteric Initiatic Symbolism the object set before the candidate for initiation is a search for the lost word, which entitled him to receive a master's wages, the wages of the real master, for the revelation and internal experiences which flow from the possession of virtue. The esoteric knowledge is of value only when one comprehends how to apply it. This is in part the symbolic meaning of knowing the master's word and knowing how to pronounce the word. Each degree of the Masonic order possesses the word which expresses intelligence. 
There is only one word, but this word is pronounced in three different ways. One manner is for the apprentice and is explained by work. Another manner is for the companion and it is explained by study. And yet another manner is for the master and it is explained by wisdom. The concept and the principle of all initiation is that knowledge is unfolded by degrees in an orderly, systematic manner, step by step. As a person's ability to comprehend opens up more and more. The result is not a possession, but a growth, a progressive development of the consciousness. <laughs> to change one's being is to apply the knowledge so that a progressive change or transformation from the original structure converts the candidate into a better and better person. Real knowledge or the growth of wisdom in us is an eternal becoming, a progressive transformation into the likeness of the Supreme Being. Now let's continue our Masonic Catechism from the late 1700s. What have you come here to do? Vanquish my passion, submit my willpower, and to make new progress from Masonry. Why did you want to be received as a Mason? Because I was in darkness and I desire to know the light. What does this light signify? The knowledge and all virtues together, symbol of the architect, the great architect of the universe. Are you an apprentice? I believe I am. If you believe it, why do you not say yes? This is because masonry is an assembly of all the virtues. There is no good mason who claims that they're perfect, and especially an apprentice of whom the feelings are not yet certain. What is the work of the apprentice? To polish and smooth the brute stone. What is the word? Fair, fair. What do these two words mean? Academy or school of virtue? What is the school? Missionary. What do you understand masonry to be? I understand it to be the study of sciences and the practice of virtue. What are the greatest duties of a mason? They are to fulfill that of the state or providence has placed them to flee vice and to practice virtue. Was nothing more given to you when receiving you as a mason? They gave me a white apron and the gloves of a man and a woman, both of the same color. What does this apron mean? It is the symbol of the work. Its whiteness shows us the candor of our morals and the equality which must prevail between us. Why have you been given white gloves? To teach me that a mason must never dip his hands in iniquity or wrongdoing. Why have you been given women's gloves? To show the recipient that he must esteem and cherish his wife and that he cannot forget her for even a moment without being unjust. If you have any questions or comments, please submit them in the comments area. The esoteric significance of the three traders. The decapitation of the three traders requires work, study, and understanding. The three traders are within ourselves. They are negative emotions, negative thoughts, and negative intentions and actions. By eliminating them, we perfect ourselves. Jesus explained this in the Bible by saying, If a man if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. From Matthew uh, chapter 16, verse 24. We need to learn what it means to deny ourselves, to take up the cross, and to follow the Christ. In this way, we will achieve the sanctity that is required to become better human beings. What is religion for? 
if it is not, to become better people, to end suffering, and to make us comprehend why we're on this planet. This is what the ancient mysteries taught. The path to purity, to sanctification, to perfection. This is how we Christify ourselves. All the religions of the world have always taught the same religious principles, although the religious forms have changed based on the culture and the time period. And this is why um, that was mentioned in the second class, St. Augustine said, For what is now called the Christian religion existed even among the ancients. It was not lacking from the beginning of the human race until Christ came in the flesh. From that time, true religion, which already existed, began to be called Christian. For this reason, I said, in our times, this is the Christian religion, not because it did not exist in former times, but because it had received this name in later times. The greatest thing that Christ did was to make the ancient doctrine public on the road of Jerusalem. This ancient doctrine is the esoteric knowledge, the teaching which must be applied to ourselves in order to see its effect. And its results depend on its application. The starting point of this path is to recognize who we are and what we are. What are we doing with our energy, with our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions? If we really want to change, to transform ourselves, then we have to become serious. If we are serious, then we will recognize our lack of continuity, our lack of inner stability, and lack of continuous purpose. We are inconsistent, and we lack spiritual objectivity. We need to be serious about what we want out of life, because when we die, we will look back and say, what did I really do with my life? If our present answer doesn't satisfy us, then let's take advantage of the time we have to change our direction. Remember, quoting from the third class, that to revive the Christ within ourselves is only possible by decapitating the three traitors. The three traitors exist within ourselves. We must eliminate them from our thoughts, feelings, and actions. The objective of our studies is to stop being demons. Judas is the demon of desire. He is a terribly perverse demon, which is what the whole world has within themselves. And all of us are demons. To stop being so corresponds to the initiatic mysteries. We have to begin by recognizing that we are demons. Pilate is the demon of the mind. He's the one who always washes his hands and continues on washing them. Caiaphas is the demon of ill will. He who does not do the will of the Father is disobedient. The will of the Father must be done here and in the internal world. The will of the Father is done if there is right thought, if there is right feeling, and if there is right action. If we do something crooked or wrong, it is not the will of the Father. We must totally eliminate the ego, so that there does not remain a single subjective element within, and be a pure spirit in order to attain this. One must pay, and the price of this is life itself. This is why it said that initiation is life itself. The vanities of the world must be forgotten. And one must dedicate oneself to the great work, the work and work and work until attainment. In conclusion, they said that the kingdom of heaven is taken by force. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, this is an ethical force, a spiritual courage, and the first great battle is for the conquest of self. Man, know thyself, and you will know the universe and its God. This battle for oneself is the battle to conquer that part of us that worships time, matter, 
idea, and sensation that when worshipping the idols of the flesh is blind to the truth of the internal spirit. It is the battle against the ego, the battle to free ourselves from psychological slavery. Whosoever conquers these battles will become a master. And that concludes our presentation and the final presentation in this series. If you have any questions or comments, we'd welcome them in the comments area. Now we'll have a meditation at the same time tomorrow evening, and then we will be concluding or continuing rather our studies in two weeks' time, which makes it uh, April 7th. Uh, we will pick up a new series. You're very welcome. Thank you all again. We look forward to having you again in the next two weeks.